Welcome to season three of Public Health On Call, a podcast from the Johns Hopkins Bloomberg School of Public Health. I'm Josh Sharfstein, Vice Dean for Public Health Practice and Community Engagement and a former secretary of Maryland's Health Department. Our goal is to bring scientific evidence and experience to the public health news of the day through informative interviews with scientists, community leaders, policy experts, public health officials, clinicians, and more. If you have ideas or questions for us to cover, please email us at publichealthquestion at jhu.edu. That's publichealthquestion at jhu.edu for future podcast episodes. Today, Stephanie Desmond talks to Dr. Nirav Shah, the top health officer in Maine. They dig into the logistics of vaccine distribution and the challenges associated with this major public health endeavor. Let's listen. Nirav Shah, thanks for joining me. Thank you for having me. It's an honor to be here. Today, we're going to talk about the logistics of distributing a COVID vaccine. We were able to get the science of creating a vaccine to create a vaccine in record time. But now we're faced with this dilemma of how to get the shots to the people who need them. Why is it so hard to do something like this? Well, there, there are a few reasons, uh, which I look forward to going into in more detail. What I, will, what I will share is the way that we are approaching the logistical piece at a very, very high level. And, and as we think about it from a patient journey perspective, we think of three distinct things that need to happen, buckets that need to be understood and well executed upon. The first is identification. Which groups are we talking about? The second is notification. How are we going to let them know that it is their turn for vaccination? And then the third is vaccination. How are we actually going to register them, schedule them, consent them, and get them to a place where they can be vaccinated, as well as reserve a time at the outset for their second dose? Those are the, that that just provides at a thumbnails sketch level, the massive logistical challenges that we face. And one reason it has been so hard is because there are so many different facets of our healthcare system to begin with, hospitals, outpatient groups, primary care providers, long-term care facilities. And what we're doing as a country is taking those places and then matching them up on a matrix with people. So we're trying to come up with this matrix of who should be vaccinated at hospitals and what category, where should individuals 65 and over be vaccinated? And coming up with that matrix as we are adapting to new and different vaccines with different storage requirements, different reconstitution requirements, different observation period requirements, it just is one challenge after another after another. Now, I know that you in Maine have had some success. I also know that it's really, um, you know, you're sort of at the mercy of the federal government and when they give you your vaccine. Could you talk me through that? That has been one of the numerous challenges that we at the state level have faced. I'm really, really proud of the work that we've done in Maine uh, to get so many shots into arms as quickly as possible. Within ideally seven days of receipt of vaccine, our goal is to get as much of it as possible into arms as we can. One of the things that makes that challenging though, is that as of right now, as of the date you and I are speaking, states find out usually around Tuesday afternoon what their allocation will be of Pfizer and Moderna vaccine for the subsequent week. We have approximately 45 to 48 hours. So on Thursday, to put our order in, order in quotes, because we're not actually ordering, we're just telling the uh, Operation Warp Speed folks where we want our shipments to go. So we have about two days to understand the demand and supply throughput landscape across our states to figure out where we should allocate vaccine to so that it can be used in that subsequent period. Thursday is when the orders go in, the vaccines arrive a couple of days later on Monday and a little bit on Tuesday. And then we repeat the process, so on and so forth in subsequent weeks. That just adds to the logistical challenge because although I understand the spirit of doing just-in-time planning and delivery, only having uh, at most six days, if not really sooner, to do horizon planning makes long-term strategic planning very, very difficult because again, at most, we only have a couple of days of horizon. Eventually, we hope that that horizon will lengthen and we can plan for multi-week periods. But right now, it's almost week by week. Are you concerned about being able to receive second doses for those who've received first? 
it's a risk. Well, it's hard to know what the risk will be ultimately when it when time comes for those second doses to be delivered in large quantities. What we've learned in, in the recent 96 hours is that the physical stockpile that the U.S. government indicated that they had of those second doses that they indicated were being held in physical reserve, uh, that that stockpile was actually liquidated at the end of December or early January. And now instead, what we are relying upon for second doses is the existing production ramp. That is to say, we believe that the existing manufacturing capacity will be able to supply the second doses when the time is right, as well as the new increasing number of first doses. That entails some degree of risk. We've given up the insurance policy that we had in December where those second doses were physically on the shelves. Based on the briefings that I've had with members of Operation Warp Speed, as well as with folks at the US CDC, they believe that the production ramp of existing manufacturing is sufficiently secure that there will not be challenges with second doses. I will say, however, if we've learned anything during COVID, it's to expect the unexpected. And if there's an outbreak at the Pfizer facility in Michigan, how might that affect the supply ramp of vaccines? It's too early to tell, um, and, and we shall see what the future holds there. It is certainly a risk. It feels in many places like it's a free-for-all to find a vaccine, to sign up for a vaccine. I know that I was able to sign my my elderly mother-in-law up for a vaccine um, distribution uh, a week from now. But the question is, will there be vaccine then? Uh, I know my mother lives in Florida. She was outside. Actually, it was cold. She was outside and she was outside waiting for a vaccine. She waited all day long, eight hours before she got her vaccine. And she was one of the lucky ones. She got there at six in the morning and got number 189 out of 200. So... This, to me, doesn't seem like the right way to do it. Your thoughts? I, I, I don't disagree with that. Um, I, I recognize that if we had perfect information, we would be able to do that horizon planning multi-weeks in advance and thus allow people to be scheduled with the security of knowing that there, there are not allotted time also meant that there would be a guarantee of having a vaccine. I, I will say in my state right now, what we have been told is that our vaccine supply for new first doses will only increase anywhere from two to maybe 5% per week for the next several weeks, which makes doing that extended planning three, four, five weeks out into the future for scheduling and registration very, very difficult um, because we don't know whether there will be a vaccine for every single slot. What we've had to do in turn is communicate with our vaccine providers about what we do know, or by corollary, what little we know about the supply of vaccine, and thus not over schedule or set expectations such that every person who gets scheduled for something will get a vaccine. I think what we're doing right now is balancing the need to try to plan for the future because everyone wants nothing more than to know when their time is, is ready for vaccine. At the same time, trying to make sure that every vaccine that gets produced goes out the door as quickly as possible. Those two are somewhat in tension because we don't really have insight into how much vaccine is really able to be produced. And thus it's hard to know what the future may hold. Another challenge on top of all of that is as you noted a moment ago, how to schedule second doses. Let's just take the Moderna vaccine, which requires a second dose at day 28. If you fill up all of your slots, if you are a vaccine center or a state, and you pack in all of your slots for the next 28 days with new people who want to be vaccinated, what do you do for the next 28 days? Because you now have one case of individuals who have received their second dose, who on days 29, 30, 31, 32, that same group whom you vaccinated previously will now need to get their second dose. You have to plan in advance for slack in the system so that you can accommodate not just second doses, but new folks who want their first dose, how do you do those simultaneously? Uh, that, that is a major logistics challenge. Are you struggling with getting enough people to do the vaccinating? Is that a challenge? As of right now, having vaccinators has not been our rate limiting step, but that is sure to change. As vaccine supply increases, then the demand for skilled vaccinators will certainly change. One of, one of the things that we've done to prepare for that is to work with schools of nursing and allied health and medicine across the state of Maine 
to have those students who are currently enrolled in, say, a nursing program be ready to serve as vaccinators. We've also tapped into a wide and diverse array of volunteers in Maine who are, say, retired pharmacists who are willing and able to serve. We know that we are going to need that force of vaccinators. We haven't needed them quite yet, but at some point in the near future where supply outstrips demand, we're going to need those vaccinators. So we're not waiting for that. We're marshalling those forces now. We are at the moment at a place where demand outstrips supply. And I know that there was a concern that people weren't going to want this vaccine. I have a feeling that that one does not equal the other. I mean, it's still we still might end up not having getting everybody vaccinated. Is that right? That's right. You know, it's interesting right now because what we're dealing with as a country, as well as in my state of Maine, is intensity of belief. We have uh, one group of individuals that very intensely wants vaccine immediately. And my goal is to try to get vaccine into those who are within our various groups of concern, those over 70, et cetera. We have another group across the country, not just in any one state, who very intensely does not want a vaccine. And so what we're seeing right now, when you see news stories, is the manifestation of those dual intensities, those who very intensely want a vaccine and those who very intensely don't believe in it and don't want it. Uh, And that's what I think is what's leading to a bit of cognitive dissonance. Uh, On one hand, we see lines of folks lined up in Florida and Texas. And on the other hand, we see folks protesting even the very notion of a vaccine. It seems difficult to reconcile that. Uh, Ultimately, I think surveys have shown that right now, acceptance of the vaccine is on the increase. That's a very good thing. It was previously very low back in September, but it started going up. That is an interesting phenomenon because the malleability of individuals as willing to, willingness to be vaccinated suggests that it's changeable. It suggests that with good science and truth-based uh, education, we can actually keep that number going up. Some folks take a look at those numbers and say, people don't know what they want and they throw their hands up. I take a look at those changing acceptance rates and say, this is an opportunity because with good, thoughtful approaches where we listen to fears and respond to them with facts, we can actually keep those acceptance rates going up. You know, one thing that I, I, you know, just in sort of telling you about my personal experience getting my elderly relatives uh, the vac- vaccinated, one involved um, being able to navigate a computer and being able to take a picture of your Medicare card and all that stuff. The other was my mother heard it on the news. She was able to get in her car and drive 20 minutes to the next county. So this, um, these are folks who have the means and have the opportunity to get their vaccines. And I'm wondering if you're concerned that this is exacerbating inequality. There is no question in my mind that the cracks that we've already had in our system, which have been laid bare by COVID, will probably widen as we get through the vaccine and vaccination process. And those cracks are are multifold. They either affect, for example, the elderly, for whom being able to schedule online is not something that's familiar. They will certainly affect individuals of limited means. For example, with all the discussion around large-scale vaccination sites, a concept that we are pursuing in Maine We have to recognize that that entails being able to drive somewhere or be able to access public transportation, something that's not available to many individuals. Language challenges. In my state, just in Maine, there are a number of different languages spoken by individuals who have come to Maine in recent years from Burma, Cambodia, Somalia. Having language access will be a major challenge. What we are trying to do is to learn from the mistakes that we made with respect to testing and contact tracing. I will, um, the buck stops with me in my state. I made numerous mistakes with respect to not understanding these nuances and how they could present barriers. And this has, having been in public health for a number of years, I'm hoping we don't repeat those. For example, in one particular area of Maine, where there's a high population of Somali and other immigrants, uh, refugee immigrant communities from across Southern and Eastern Africa, we're hoping to do specialized outreach for them. So they, again, have the facts as well as if needed to provide support services so folks can be brought to vaccination sites, not the other way around. It's going to be a challenge, but you're absolutely right. This is a concern we have right now. And it's one we should address now rather than later. Nirav Shah, thank you so much for your time. Public Health On Call is produced by Josh Sharfstein, Lindsay Smith-Rogers, and Stephanie Desmond. Audio production by Spencer Greer, Niall Owen McCusker, CN Oates, and Matthew Martin, with support from Chip Hickey. Distribution by Nick Moran. Production support from Catherine Ricardo, 
and Neiman Outlin. Social media support from Brenda Hagader, Grace Holes Fernandez, and Caroline Wong. Thank you for listening. Thank you.